First, uh, let's get on to God. It's a blessing to be here, number one, especially during this pandemic. And I hope everyone's safe, and I hope all your family is safe. And, and remember, just stay safe. You know, we just got to live with it, you know. Um, um, I know Dr. Smith you know, called my office at the last moment, and we try to light up the whole city of Dallas, so it's going to be a little at a time. You know, we, we did Bank of America. We, we tried to do a reunion, but, um, but also thank you for the artists. I mean, you know, it's one thing that I remind everyone, when you look at a picture, it can say many things, but it's what the vision there. You know, you have the vision, and people look at that. They got to take that vision back, and pictures tell a whole lot of things in the world, and that's how we live with it. You know, you don't have to speak. Just look at it. Use your own imagination. I'm here to um, introduce Donovan Lewis as a co-host of the Norman ND from noon. 10 to noon. I said noon. I said 10 to noon. 10 to noon. Sports radio. You know, I kind of get 10 to noon. I don't know at midnight or whatever, you know, back and forth. At 96.7 and 1310, the ticket. Born and raised in Dallas, Texas. Devon started his career in radio at 57.5701 KLIF on July 1993 before working at 93.3. The bone from 2004 to 2006. He began. At the ticket, working with Bass D from 2006 to 2015, before co-hosting the, tick, the Texas Radio Hall of Fame member, Nun Hensley, started August of 2015. Now, let's get to the, the big doll in the room, Eric Dickerson from Silly, you know, Hall of Fame running back. Give him a good hand. You know, I got to get that, you know, hey. You, you know. Like I said, he, he played for the Lost in the Round, you know, uh, the history. He owned a single season, season rushing record, yard record, football most mark, the biggest mark in the NFL rushing, 2,105 yards. That's a whole lot of yards, 1984. Again, 2,105, that's a whole lot of yards. He accomplished 10,000 yards quicker than anyone. You know, you look at Jim Brown, you look at everyone, all the great stars. He is a guy. But also, fastest in the latest history, born and raised in Sicily. You know, I don't know where no Sicily, Texas, that, but he came to SMU. We were glad that he did not go the other way. You know, he came to SMU. You know, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna say the other school, but you know, he came to SMU. <laughs> Eric became the country's top recruit as a high school senior and committed to Southern Methodist University where he anchored the famous Pony Express. He did start a Pony Express. Back Phil Dixon is the author of Watch My Sp Smoke. Again, Watch My Smoke. And if you haven't read the book, I'm gonna read it. Now, I wish I had read it before I got here. I wanna see how the smoke, how you watch smoke go. You know, not burning, but you're just watching the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> the Eric Dixon story, he's also carrying an analysis, an analysis for the FSI 1, FS, FS1, and joined the round front office as vice president of business development. He lived in Los Angeles, but vice president of business development. I was a football agent. There were not that many African Americans in the vice president in business development. I think one was Larry Lee with the Detroit Lions way back there, but that's an honor to be in the NFL to show that we can do something on the field, but we also do something off the field. With that, further ado, Donovan, you can take over. Do I come up? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, they don't, they're not here to okay, see me. Okay. Right. <laughs> I, I can promise you that. <laughs> First off, Absolute honor and a pleasure Thank you, to uh, share the stage with you and all the accomplishments that the councilman had uh, gave before. First off, before we get into the book and everything, I want to say congratulations because the Rams won the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know in uh, reading the book that uh, you never got a chance to play in it, but just tell me how it felt for the organization to finally get over the hump with you a part of it and to uh, get that Super Bowl victory? Well, I think it's big for not just the organization, but mostly the city of Los Angeles. It, it'll be no different than winning the Super Bowl in Dallas again. I mean, we've never won a Super Bowl in Los Angeles. I mean, you've had the Raiders come through and won a Super Bowl. And, and I still say this, and I think Ram fans have to admit it's still, LA is still a Raider town because, you know, we were gone for 22 years. 
and coming back to, the, to, to LA now and, and winning a Super Bowl. You know, we're trying to compete with the Dodgers, <laughs> the right. Lakers, you know, and you know, the Chargers also and the Rams. But it was really good for the city of LA to, to win a, a Super Bowl. Of all the great teams we've had with the, from the fearsome force of the teams that we had, we were never able to win that Super Bowl. But I'm just happy for the players because I was one of those guys. I know how tough it is to get out there and try to, you know, win week after week. It does seem impossible, though, that the NFL would be out of Los Angeles. Like, that doesn't even seem real. One of the biggest markets in the, uh, in the United States, and you didn't have football there for a long time. So it is kind of cool not to have just the Rams back, but the Chargers there also. And like you said, uh, to get that Super Bowl win for the city is pretty cool. It is because, I mean, you're right. I mean, you think about L.A., you think they should have a football team. But the thing about living in Los Angeles is people think that we don't have, you know, ah, oh, the fans in L.A., they don't, they don't care about sports. But they really do. Right. L.A. is a, really a sports town. I mean, think about the Dodgers. I mean, they have great fans. I mean, the Lakers have great fans. But, you know, when it comes time, it comes to history. In L.A., you've got to win. Right, <laughs> you know right. I'm telling you? If you ain't winning, they'll go to the beach, they'll go to the mountains, they're like, man, that's a thousand <laughs> thing. They're going to go watch, you know, they're going to watch you lose. So, you know, you, you've got to win. So, and, and that's what we've done the last couple of years is been able to put a winning product on the field. Okay, let's get into the book. Okay. Because right. uh, I, uh, I guess the first question I want to ask you is you've had all these stories and stuff kind of built up in you. Uh, why did you decide to put it all out there on paper? And uh, was it kind of therapy for you, I guess, just to kind of get all that out? Why did you decide to share your story with everyone? Well, you know, you know, when you, when you talk to different players, I tell you, you know, my friends and, you know, people that know me, and they would all say, man, Eric, man, your story, your life is so interesting. People don't know this, you know, they don't know it. And people don't know a lot about me. I mean, um, I've always been kind of private. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, basically, my story was just, I held a lot in, I held a lot in, even dealing with, you know, the contract disputes, you know, how I left the Rams back then and, and how I was betrayed, you know, as, as, that, as, a, as that kind of player, like, you know, like I said in the book, in the, in the paper, they called me a, a malcontent. Uh, and and I, I'm like, what the hell is a malcontent? You know? <laughs> right. I didn't know what that was, <laughs> you know. You know, they, they called you things you never heard of. Right. You know, and, and, and I think the, the thing that, that, that bothered me the most about all of this when I think about it was my mother had to read that because I didn't read articles. My, I got to give my old coach Ron my credit. He said, look, sons, he said, stay out them papers. He said, you read them articles, you start believing that stuff. He said, one minute they love you, the next minute they hate you. So I just made it a point. He was right. I just never, I just stopped reading articles. And when my mother would read it, she was Eric. She said, this is not, the, this is not you. This is not the son I raised. Right. And I know it. And that's the, I think that was the most painful thing about the whole writing the book and just thinking about, you know, how she you know, had to deal with that. Because sure. I was like, Mom, well, you know, I, you know, I see this is, this is how the NFL is, you know. Right. There's a lot of, some of you with the NFL, but, you know, and just in life, I mean, in life, I mean, I, she taught me so much, you know, and, and I say my mother, I think a lot of people didn't know I was adopted. I was legally adopted. You know, my mother was born, and she was really my great, great aunt, and she was born in 1904. And she would tell me so many things about, you know, just history, like, you know, things I saw. She said, Eric, she said, you know, the things I saw, you know, you just wouldn't even believe, you know, and, and, and the, like the black, white, I, black and white issues were. And I won't forget when I, one of the first times I, I went out for sports. And because um, there was no organized sports, you know, until you got to like seventh grade, but sure. we, play, we could play a little baseball. And so I would say, you know, I knew I was a good baseball player. I knew I was a good baseball player. And I knew I could make the little league baseball, it's little league or minor league. I knew I could, I, I, was, I, I was good. Right. So I go, I had to try for little league baseball and I want to hit three home runs in the trials, you know, and could throw and run, you know, all of it. And you know, they pick when they start picking kids, I didn't make it. And I'm like, I was so hurt. I mean, I was hurt. And she said, Eric, she said, I'm telling you, son. She said, and she just said, like, she said, you're a black kid, Eric, it's different for you. It's gonna be different. So you'll learn that. And that was my first experience, kind of my first experience, but you know, make a long story short, like, I think like after I played like three games, I was hitting so many home runs, I went, I, they moved me to the Little League. So I did get on the League after <laughs> right, all. Right. So. <laughs> any, any hesitancy about sharing some of the stuff? Because you do get pretty personal in this thing. And it's, uh, you know, about your childhood growing up and, and all the adversities and all that. So, and even the, the, the stories that everyone wants to know about that we'll get to here. We'll get to that, I'm sure. But any hesitancy about sharing some of the things when you started uh, the writing process? You know, no, because I just wanted to 
to, I want to be truthful. I mean, when people know that know me know one thing about me. Guys said, man, if you don't want the truth, don't ask Eric. Sure. And I say, don't ask me. <laughs> Somebody lied to you. Don't ask, I'm, not, I'm not the guy to ask. You know, even by myself. I right. mean, I'm not, the, I'm not that, I mean, and, I, and I'm not ever trying to hurt people, someone's feelings, but, you know, I just, I just tell the truth. And, you know, one of the stories in the book, you know, and it's funny because, you know, going to the Hall of Fame, you know, you know all the guys in the hall, and, you know, just being a, a professional player, you know, we all talk about high school. You know, your high school, what high school you went to. We'd always, you know, tease your high school, this high school. And the guys would talk about their coaches. You know, like, man, my, if my, if my high school coach, it was this. And, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be, be at the events and the, they would be thanking their high school coach. And I won't forget, Michael Urban asked me one day, he said, man, Eric, how was you, how did you how, like your high school coach? I said, I couldn't stand that man. And, um, he's, you know, and I told him the story. Sure. And, and I'll tell you the story. Matter of fact, uh, my high school coach um, came from East Texas. Um, when I got to high school, I was playing you know, ninth grade, played varsity in my ninth grade year. And he, had, he was, had never coached blacks before, never coached black kids. And so, you know, we had heard some stuff, but you know, you don't believe what you hear. You know, I didn't, we didn't know him and he didn't know us. To make a long story short, he got there and it was bad. I mean, it was really bad. It was so bad that I quit football. As a matter of fact, all the black kids quit except one guy named Winston Brown. He was the only one that stayed. And, you know, it was, it was a point where, I mean, I loved, I loved football. I loved playing it. I mean, I just, I just loved it. I loved everything about it. And, but it was, I just couldn't deal with him. And not just me, but all of us couldn't deal with him. So uh, I won't forget, he, he, he had us all line up because in, in, he wanted where in your locker, you couldn't have anything in the bottom of your locker but your shoes. If anything was in the bottom of your locker, you got to run. But just lo and behold, it was all of us, the black guy. Right, <laughs> right. And I'll never forget a kid named Kevin Kubrick, and I write about him in my book. Uh, Kevin said, man, that's just, that's just wrong. He was a white kid, he said, and he knew it was wrong. It's just wrong. And so we ran, we ran, we'd run and run. And we'd say, well, when are we going to stop? Until I say stop. So I remember one, one kid quit, another kid quit, another kid quit. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. And I'm, I think I was one of the last ones. I said, it's crazy. I, I just quit. I said, I'm, I hate to say quit, but that's what I just, I, he, he got me. And let's fast forward. Um, we all quit. And he, he came to our house. Well, a guy named James Abernathy came to my house a couple of weeks before. From, he was lived in another town called Brookshire. And he said, um, <coughs> wanted to talk to me. And he didn't want to talk to me. And I, we saw him pull up. I knew he'd call him, his name was Shaq. Call him Shaq. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, Shaq, what's up? And he said, hey, Ms. Dickerson, you mind if I take, take Eric and talk to him? She said, sure, take him and talk to him. So I went and got in the car. And uh, he said, hey, Eric. I said, how are you doing, Shaq? I mean, you know, I was 15 or 16, and he was like, 28 or 30, and it's me. that was like an old guy. Right, He's right, an old guy. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm an old guy. <laughs> he's, old, he's an old man, you know, I'm like, but I'm an old, I'm, I'm young. So he said, he said, he said, let me talk to you. I said, I said, yeah, I said, what's up, Shaq? He said, he, we rode around. And you gotta think, in my hometown, there's only one red light, one red light in Sealy, and really nothing now. He said, Eric, he said, let me ask you, what do you see in this town? I said, I said, I don't see nothing in here. He said, well, I heard you quit football. I said, yeah, I quit, man. I, I told him the whole story, he said, Eric, he said, let me say something to you, son. And it's just amazing how older people are, have, that have more wisdom can see things that you can't see. He said, Eric, he said, you're one of the best football players we've ever seen in these parts, athlete, period. And I'm like, think about it, I'm a, I think I'm a sophomore. I'm like, I didn't see that. I'm like, I couldn't see it. He said, Eric, I'm, saying, I'm telling you, he said, look, if you, if you, if you don't want to play in Sealy, come to play in Brookshire. That's why I said, Brookshire, he said, and he said, I'm telling you, son, you can get out of it, you can get your scholarship and possibly get out of this town. So let's fast forward, I, I went back home and my mother said, so what did he say to you? I told her, I said, you know, you know what he said, you know. And she said, she said, I don't like you quitting. I wish that you would go back and play. See, I, she hated football. I don't like that sport, but I don't want you to be a quitter. She said, go back and play or, or I'll take you over to Brookshire and let you play there. So make a long story, another story short, he came, the coach came over the next day. And I think my best friend called me and said, hey, man, is Coach Harris been by your house? I said, no, he said, he's on his way. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so he, he came by my house and, he said he, he talked to me and my mother about coming back and you know he made some mistakes blah 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 so I'm like okay so we did go back and we played we all went back and played now I would say it wasn't no feel good story none of that kind of stuff wasn't no you know we but we won a state championship we did win a state championship uh, in spite of him and you know we never got him and I never got along we never got along I mean and the thing is is that when I was a young kid I was taught to respect older people. So in a sense, it was hard for me to be disrespectful, but I was being disrespectful, right. not in a sense, because he would talk crazy to us, and I would say something back. 
you know, which is, a, you know, you just, you don't do that. That's how right. you're taught in Texas. You know, you, you be respectful. And I won't forget one time, because he wanted me to go to the University of Texas. And I found out later why. He said, look, I, uh, Texas recruited me. I said, well, I like the school. He said, look, if you don't, you're not interested in going to Texas, I just tell all the schools you don't want to go to college. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You do what you want. I said, I don't need you. Right. I said, they want me to, I, they'll come to my house and get me. So sure enough, that's exactly what happened. That's, you know, and and that's, that's what happened. You know, they come to my house. You know, and I, they, they, would, they would ask me, I said, my high school coach, I said, I don't like that man. I don't like him. We don't right. get along. And so I must make this show, I'm going to fast forward to, to, to the end of this story with him. So about two years ago, I get a call from a guy at the golf course. I'm, play, I'm, I'm playing golf, and, and he said, hey, Eric. I said, I said, what's up, Dana? How you doing, man? I said, good, man. And he talked. He said, Mike, I said, I want to say hi to you. I said, OK. He gets on the phone. He said, hey, Eric, as soon as I heard his voice, <laughs> as soon as I heard his voice, my heart started beating fast. Right, just think about right. that. That just shows you the impact that a, 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 a adult can have on a kid. And I'm a grown man now. Sure. I think I'm a 55. My heart started beating fast. And he said, hey, Eric, I, I said, what's up, Ralph? I mean, I, I've got my voice real deep. <laughs> I make sure you know I'm a man now. <laughs> I, I, I said, what's up, Ralph? He said, I'm good, Eric. I said, well, I said, well, I said what can I do for you, man? He said, Eric, I just want to tell you, I've seen all the stuff you did. Great NFL career. I said, thank you. I appreciate it, man. He said, but I want to say something to you. I just want to apologize the way I treated you guys. I want to apologize to you. I said, Ralph, I said, that means a lot to me. I said, I want to say thank you for saying that. So, you know, and he just passed away. But like I say, that meant a lot to me as, a, as, a, as an adult because, I, you know, I knew I was wrong with certain things, but I just knew I was right to stand up. Did you think it was kind of hard to understand why he was doing the things that he, would, he was doing? And uh, growing up in, in Sealy, yeah. uh, according to your book, you know, it's the tracks. It's one side and the other yeah. side. And that's how towns in Texas kind of were when you were growing up. So yeah. did, was it kind of hard to comprehend why he was doing that when he probably should have seen the talent that you had on the football field and, and should have been treated a little bit better and fairly? Well, fairly. Not just, just me, all of us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know. The thing was is, is that, you know, I grew up in segregation where, you know, I went to the black school and the white school, but we all knew each other in that town. So mm -hmm. we as kids, we didn't see, you know, we wasn't, it wasn't like that. And it's funny how kids are. You know, kids are, you know, especially a young kid, child, they're so innocent. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I look, hey, that's Kevin. Right. You know, that's not white Kevin. That's not, it's not black Eric, you know. <laughs> that's just Kevin, you know. That's Julie. You know, that's, that's Julie. That's not white Julie. This is not black Samantha. I mean, and so, in a sense, yes. I mean, it, it really bothers me. It really bothers me. You right. know, still to this day, you know, I have a real problem with, I just can't get it when a person doesn't like you for the color of your skin. Right. I, mean, I just, I, I'm like, I just don't understand that. I still, like, I don't understand how a person feels like that. I have more money than you, so I'm better than you. Right. Even that part, it's just, and, and I, I guess that's just how I was brought up because my mother and my dad, taught me, you know, you treat everybody the same. And, and I'm going to tell you, man, my, 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 like I said, my mother, she grew up in a time where it was different. I mean, she would tell you, she said, Eric, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I saw. Right. I saw the, the cruel things, how the, they would hang the black men and cut their privacy. And stick. I mean, she told me this. You know, as a kid, I'm like, I, I mean, I couldn't, like, sure. I, couldn't, I couldn't relate to that because right. I'd never seen it. But as time goes on, you see the, the things that were wrong. But you know what? It never scarred me and made me like 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 hate a, a race that's just that, that's that's not in me so be growing up here in dallas i uh i was born and raised in south oak cliff and uh turned 50 last year so i think every guy's dream in here if i if i can speak for every fella in here is thinking that they can become a professional athlete <laughs> <laughs> but for me I was like 4'8 and like 80 pounds. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure early on that my professional dreams would dash pretty quickly. But I want to know from you, and I like to ask this question of everyone that I speak to, when did you realize not only were you pretty good at this, but you could make a living. You could succeed, make a living, and make a lot of money doing what you're really good at. And I think it takes longer for it to click for some people, but when did it click for you that, man, not only am I pretty dang good, I can make a living at the next level. You know, I had no idea, honestly. I mean, it wasn't like it is now, like, you know, the kids are recruited early, recruited, you know, early, and they tell them, you know, you're going to be the next coming. They put this all in their head. Um, 
I didn't really have an idea that I was possibly going to be drafted until I think really my senior year. Okay. And, 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 I, and I won't forget, I won't go to my friend Harvey, Harvey Armstrong, who played at SMU. I go by his apartment. He wanted me to come over because they're in town playing the Eagles. And I want you to meet Wilbur Montgomery. And I like Wilbur running back. So I go over and I'm, I'm like, and I go over and I get a chance to meet him. Like, man, I'm like, he's a little bitty guy. I'm like, man, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> like, he can play, I can play. That's what I'm thinking. Right. And say, Harvey, say, hey, man, Eric, I want to tell you, man, the Eagles asked me to, you know, to talk to you because, you know, if, if they have a chance, they're going to get you. I'm like, really? I mean, I'm like, really? He said, he said yeah. He said, man, you don't know. He said, man, you're going to be a number one draft pick. And I'm like, I'm like, what does the number one draft pick get? I mean, I'm talking to him like, <laughs> like he's an agent. I'm like, really, man? He said, yeah. I'm like, man, you got, everybody asking about you. You know, ask me how big you are because, you know, it didn't, it didn't have, like, you don't have all the cell phone, you know, all the stuff. It was all projector back then. He right. said, you know how big you are, how fast you are because you're so tall. They want to know about your speed. And I said, man, he's fast. So I'm like, wow. So I really didn't, I didn't have an idea until really my senior year. And then, you know, as time went on, I mean, I, the crew, you know, the agents and all start coming to me. And sure. I'm, you know, what round I would get drafted. That's when I had an idea that I could possibly play pro football. Until then, I just, I just love playing it. That was it. Uh, I'm, we're, I'm not sure we're going to skip around a little bit because I do want to talk about the recruiting process as far as going from high school to college. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, uh, reading your book, you said it's the one question that everyone always to this day asks you about. And, again, we'll get to that in just a second. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, you talked about pro football as far as being able to play at the next level your senior year of college. Mm -hmm. You had to realize that when you were in high school, especially your senior year of high school, with everyone coming to talk, try to talk to you and, uh, and, and get you to come to their school, that, okay, I do have something special here. And those decisions to try to get to where you want to go had to be a difficult one for a senior in high school for all the choices that you had to say, all right, I have to pick one to try to better myself and, 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 make, a, and make the right choice. It was it's so difficult yeah. because you got, pretty much you got one, you got one shot at it. Right. You know, she's you know, going to transfer and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it was hard. I mean, because everybody was, everybody was recruiting me. I mean, and like I say, I'm from a shotgun town, a little one, one horse town. I'm the, I'm the number one recruit in the whole nation. That, I'm like, it blew my mind when I read it and I read it in the paper, you know, it was me, Elway Marino, in that order. Okay. And I'm like, pretty good order. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. It's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the recruiting process was really tough, you know, trying to narrow down schools. You know, coaches come to your house all times and I talking to you, you know, we got to have you and I'm going to give you and I'm going to lose my job. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I mean, and they make you feel guilty. Right. But they make you feel guilty. I won't forget, I, the guy from A&M came to my house. It was like one in the morning. And uh, my mother, she came and she said, hey, Eric. I'm like, I'm like, huh, what? She said, it's the coach out here. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and he said, he wants to talk to you. I'm like, OK. So I get up. I won't forget. We sit on the porch in the, night, in the middle of the night. I remember stars in the sky. And he's talking. He said, Eric, he said, I just, I'm going to lose my job if I don't get you. <laughs> I'm like, one of those. <laughs> and I'm like, man. I'm like, I don't even. He, I won't forget. He said, well, so what are you thinking about? I said, honestly, so yeah. I said, I'm thinking about going back to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's that, that, that process was really tough. And, and I got to say this, you know, SMU was not my first choice. My first choice was OU. That's why I wanted to go to school. I mean, I really did. I wanted to go to Oklahoma. I, you know, I saw the boomer sooner. You know, I'm like, Billy Sims. I'm like, oh, I we got to look good in that uniform. They recruited me heavily, very, very heavily. Uh, I, I committed to them. Matter of fact, they came to my house, and Coach Switzer came with three coaches, and they showed me a national championship tape. And, uh, you know, Billy Sims is leaving, you know, it's be your spot. And right. I told him, I said, I'm, I'm committed. I never forget, my mother was really quiet. She didn't say much. She just sit there. <laughs> and so when, when they walked out, she said, You ain't going to school now. I'm like, Mama, nope, you ain't going there, Eric. I'm like, Mom, I just she said, she said, I say, Why? She said, That man's a liar. <laughs> That man's a liar, and I don't trust him. I'm like, come on. You say, you're a Texas boy. Why are you going away to Oklahoma? So sure enough, make a loan, you know. <laughs> so finally, you know, Ron Meyer came to recruit me. And I'm going to tell you, Ron is the only reason I came to SMU. I mean, he got me. He got my mother. He got her. And he got me. But he got her first. And I'll never forget, we were at the house, and he was talking. She, she looked at all of them like, like yeah, we, we, you know, what you want. But he, I'll never forget, we were sitting there, and he said, Mr. Dickerson, you got a thing to eat. She said, sure, let's go in the kitchen. And so he went in the kitchen. He was helping my mother we fry some chicken. I'll never forget it. 
and she was he was talking to her, and I'm I'm like, oh, this is this, this it, this is it, <laughs> right? This it. I said, this is it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> no, I got no choice. <laughs> and I never get when 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 he told he said, Miss Dixon, I promise you this, I'll make him a good man. She's saying, if I ever have a problem with him, I'll call you. And you know, boom, she, you know, she said when he left, she said, that's why I want you to go to school. And so that's get the I, mama, get the son. You get the mama, yeah, get the son. Yeah. And, that, that's, and, and that's really what happened. I mean, that's how, that's how I wound up at SMU. And I'll tell you, I committed to AM at first. And I committed to AM because of pressure from that, that being in Aggie Town. Sure. And I would get my mother and my grandmother, because we had a barbecue one weekend. And, and she said, are you happy with that decision? This is before, this is before, even before, AM, before SMU. I said, no. She said, I knew it. And then my mother went to the whole, I want you to go to stay in Texas, go to SMU. So, and I went back to Ron Meyer and, you know, went, committed to him. And man, I, I, and I can honestly say, it's the best decision that my mother made for me. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is because uh, not, not that you made it for yourself. No, yeah, but she made it for me because it. I can tell you. I mean, I, cause after my after my freshman year, I called no myself. I, I called Oklahoma. I called them in the offseason. I'm, I'm like, I called up to Oklahoma. Called, you know, no, wasn't no cell phone. Got on the phone. <laughs> Dial operator. Can I have Oklahoma football? Hold on a second. And they came in Oklahoma football. Oklahoma football. I said, Can I speak to Coach Switzer? Hold on, let me send you to the secretary. I, I still remember that nigga lady's name, Susie. Hi, this is Susie. Can I help you? I didn't say anything. Coach Swiss's office. I just hung up. I said, I'm gonna wait until I get home and tell my mom I want to transfer. So boom, I, I wait, I go home, because I think we off that, it was the night in the holidays, I go home. I said, Mom, I want to talk to you. She said, what? She said, I said, I want to transfer. She said, boy, sit your ass. <laughs> <laughs> never, never forget it. She took a piece of paper, put a line down the middle. She said, SMU and other. She said, okay, so you want to transfer? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, so you got a scholarship at SMU. I have a scholarship. Check. Are you guaranteed a scholarship at OU? But uh, 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 nope, are you guaranteed? Well, that's an X. <laughs> are you playing at SMU? Yeah, I'm playing, but not, are you playing? Yep, that's a check. <laughs> are you guaranteed? I mean, guaranteed you're going to play. Well, uh, uh, that's an X. <laughs> so make a long story short, it was all checks on SMU side. <laughs> all X is on. All X on OU side. <laughs> and she said, boy, take your ass back there. <laughs> and I went Very back. <laughs> and, and that's it. So did you ever think that the two words that will be told to you forever and ever would make such an impact when it was happening? And of course, those two words are trans am. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever think? <laughs> Absolutely not. That, that when those keys were put in your hand, that the picture would, would be what it was and the story would be what it was. And to this very day, that's what everyone wants to talk about with you. It's, it's trans, trans it's a trans, and They call it the trans a &M. Yeah, trans a &M, that's right. Yep, uh, you know, this, I, I told a story in the book, and I'll just tell, I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you before you even read the book, I'll give you the, what happened. <laughs> So I liked it. I, I loved that Trans Am. I saw it. I went to a place called Leo Jonigan. That's where I was at. I used to drive by it every day, going into Houston to see my grandmother. I'm like, damn, look at that Trans Am. I used to pull in there. I had a, we had, old, I had an old beat up truck, raggedy truck. I would drive. Had it started with a screwdriver. Okay, all right. Pull, pull in Leo. I'm like, man, just walk around, just look at the cars. And, uh, you know, guys, can I help you? I said, no, I'm just looking at it. So, boom, fast forward. You know, my mother knew I liked the car. And, uh, you know, AM had got word because they wanted me to go there. I liked the car. So one day, my mom said, Eric, we're going to go down to Houston. We're going to, to Houston uh, today. So me, I meet your grandmother over at Leo Johnny. And I said, the dealership? Yeah. So cool. <laughs> so we go over to the dealership, sitting there. They say, take the car. Take it, go, take it for a test drive. Take it for a drive. Drove the car around. Come back. How you like it? Love it. <laughs> you know? And my grandmother, my mom, uh, my, my stepfather, and it was two white guys. I don't know who these guys were. The, 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 the guy from the dealership, you know, they were talking. They talked, I saw them talking. Came out, there you go, it's yours. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> cool, so I, I was happy, I was so happy. Right. So boom, I leave the car, now boom, this fast was so, that was, that was a Friday. Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, NCAA was at the school, at, at the high school. <laughs> they, 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 were at, they were at the school. And I won't forget the guy, I was in lab class, and. Um, the teacher said, hey, Eric, a guy wants to talk to you outside. So I go out, he said, uh, I'm, 
Bob something, I'm from the NCAA, I want to talk to you about your Trans Am you have. I said, well, okay, you got to talk to my mother about that. I said, so I, I, I need to go to the office and call mom. I said, mom, I said, hey, the NCAA is here talking about this. She said, okay. She said, all right, well, tell them, you know, how we get there. I just wait till after school, he can follow you home. I said, okay. Sure enough, he waited till I got out of class and he followed me home. And my mother, she told me, you just going to leave, leave out the room. And uh, he said that, um, you know, talking about the car. And this, going, this went on for uh, like a month straight. This, this, this happened. Finally, I forgot, this man did tell us. He said that he was getting, they were getting three to 400 calls a day about that car, you know, where it came from, you know, who bought it, you know. But you could, you could never, nobody could find out anything. Right, right. So um, finally, I will never forget, the man was just at our house so much, he would eat dinner with us. That's how, <laughs> and he just became like part of the family almost. And so he told, he told, he told me, he told my mother, he said, you know, when I did the start this investigation, I was positive we were just going to be a quick fix, you know, and you know that he's going to get caught and get busted. But, you know, we can't find anything. And then the next day, I didn't see it. So I asked Mom, I said, Mom, what happened to Bob? She said, your grandmother talked to him and told him, let me tell you something. If I see you again, if we see you again, and if, if you come or the NCAA come, we're going to sue you personally and the NCAA. Never saw that man again after that. Never saw him again. And finally, my, my grandma, she always said, you ain't got to worry about that car. That car was bought legally. I'm like, OK, so boom, now let's jump it. Now I'm in the pros. I think I was in the pros. I retired. I said, Mama, how did that car come about? Because <laughs> she always said, don't you worry about that. So, how did that car come about? She said, well. Your grandmother, because my grandmother and grandfather, they could afford that car, because they had, they, we got a new car pretty much, they got a new car pretty much every couple of years, a Cadillac, and that black, you know, black people, that was our, that was our oh, Mercedes yeah. Benz, oh, yeah. that's Mercedes oh, yeah. Benz black man. So, so they got a Cadillac pretty much every couple of years. So my grandmother wrote a check, they wrote a check and paid for it, $14,500, that's what that car cost, I didn't stick see the sticker. And she said, my, you know, we paid for that car, Eric. She said, and then A&M gave him the money back, <laughs> gave him the cash back, and that's how the car was bought. I'm like, oh, okay. So SMU really had no tie to that car. Right. That's what they always thought it was SMU's car. But no, it, that car was, I guess, like this was the Trans Am. And that's how I found out how it was taken, because I had no clue. <laughs> so that's the Trans Am story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we, uh, we, we come to SMU, and it, that's a really good part of the book also, because, you know, I, I, I think sometimes uh, athletes, when they're being recruited, they don't think about the other people that are being recruited along with them and maybe mm -hmm. told the same story. So you get here to SMU, mm -hmm. and now you're sharing carrots, where you've been the man, you won a uh, championship in high school, and now I guess talk about your, uh, you having to wrap your mind around sharing carries when maybe you were told that you were going to be the man when you got here, and how that affected you and how you almost left. Well, I mean, I think, I think, I think that's, that's any kid that goes to college. They, they all, all these coaches tell you, man, we got you, we don't need nobody else. Right, you right. Know, we tell the next kid, hey, we got you, we don't need nobody else. We got you, we don't need nobody else. They tell, they tell you all that. They tell, they tell them all that lie. I mean, it's a lie. But it's the truth in a sense. But, you know, the thing was is that I knew they were recruiting Craig. Craig knew they were recruiting me. And we played the same position. We, you know, we thought we'd be in the backfield together. And essentially, it, it just it wasn't working out at first. It wasn't working out. And then we had another guy in the mix with Charles Wagner. To me, that was better than, to me, both of us in our freshman year. But Charles ended up getting hurt. And I was frustrated. I mean, I really was frustrated. But, you know, I was playing, and, you know, we, we started winning. So that, that changed everything. But I'll never forget, it was one day, uh, I think it was my junior year, I told my, my best friend, Charles Drayton, I said, man, I said, I should be getting more carry, Drayton. I'm telling you, man. I said. It's just and nothing against Craig because he had nothing against me. But that, you know, we both, 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 both wanted the ball. And he said, I said, I, and I just, you know, I just kind of bent it to him. He said, Dick, let me tell you something. He said, if you as good as you say you are, you would do more with less carries. And I'll never get my reply. I'm gonna show you how good I am. And that's when I just took it to another level. I mean, I learned how to lift weights. He taught me up my best friend Charles taught me how to lift weights, and I was killing it. I mean, it really was because I. I won't forget, we played a and I had 14 carries on that 200 yards. And I was just, you know, my, 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 my God-given ability that God gave me, I would say, was second to nobody's. And I'm, I'm not bragging about that, but that's what it was. I mean, it was a God, but I worked at it too. I think people think that when you're talented, you don't have to work. I mean, that's being business, 
writing, athlete, you have to work at it. Right. And I worked my ass off at it. And, and so for me, it was tough at first, but I'll say this much, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because when I got to the pros, I had never had a surgery, I hadn't been beat up. Craig was pretty much like me, hadn't been beat up. I've still never had a surgery. And I've play, I played 11 years in the National Football League. I thank God for that. But, you know, I mean, I think we saved each other's careers in a sense, um, just not getting beat up. So all the success, <clears throat> excuse me, that you guys had here at SMU, almost winning that national championship. They cheated us. <laughs> Man, they cheated us. Man, oh, we talked about that today. Oh, that's frustrating to me, man. God. Okay, how did they cheat you? Let's they, go. We're the only undefeated team in the nation. We play, we, all right, I think uh, Pitt, they gave it to Pitt. Pitt had mm -hmm. lost to Alabama, got beat by Alabama. And Georgia had lost to someone. We ended up tying Arkansas the last game of the year. I think we were two at that time. And Arkansas was like seven or eight. We tied them. We should have went for the win. And if Ron would have been the coach, I would have went for the win, no doubt. We tied them. And they dropped us from two to four. Dropped it, I'm like, two to four, two to six, and that put us out of it. And they, they knew what they were doing. Right. Yeah, they, they knew what they were doing. But, man, how you can be the only undefeated team with a tie? That don't even make sense. I didn't do it, man. Yeah, don't be, I, don't I, get I, mad at me. I, 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 I didn't do I it. I know. I know. <laughs> so, so that's it. But I got to get over it. But I just still can't. <laughs> no, no, that's OK. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a senior, when you said you spoke to uh, Wilbur Montgomery and you, the, they said, hey, everybody wants you, and you realized, OK, I can be a professional athlete, uh, you sit back and you dream about where you want to play professionally. Was LA your first choice? Was there a team that you thought, man, if I go there, that I'm going to absolutely succeed? Or was there another team that you said, there's no way in hell I'm going there. I don't want to go there. Did you have all that, those thoughts? Of course, yeah. Mind? I mean, I knew I didn't want to go to the Houston Oilers because I was right in my hometown, right close to Houston. I didn't want to go there. And it's funny how when you're young, you think about, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy. I didn't like that all well on the helmet. Okay. I'm like, oh, that's it. I don't like that. That's, that's ugly. I didn't like that all well. I, I love, I love the Rams. I said, "Do it sound crazy?" <laughs> I said, you know, that's why. That's why I didn't want to go to a &M. I didn't like the uniforms. Okay. But, but, so uh, I love the Rams. Oh, that's that horn. The horns. Yeah, I, mean, I just love that. I said, I said, man, I look good in that uniform. <laughs> I just, I, I really liked the team. I liked the offensive line they had. I didn't know, you know, they, you didn't know much, but I knew the Rams ran the football. They were known for running the football. Um, and I really wanted to, I, I was hoping I could get, get, get to the Rams. And sure enough, they were, at that point, they were picking number three. Uh, Denver was, I mean, uh, not Denver, uh, Baltimore was first. Uh, Houston was second. The Rams had the third pick. And the night before the draft, they called me. They called me. I said, uh, Eric Dickerson, I said, yes, this is Jack Barton from the Los Angeles Rams. I said, we're going to draft you in the morning. So um, you know, we got a flight for you to be on the, and blah, blah. that's how I found out I was even getting drafted, you know, by them. And I was excited, man. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, th I mean, that was a team I, I'm glad okay. I went to. I'm glad I went to that team. Now, talk about their first training camp. Because, uh, oh, yeah. let me tell you, you something. You oh, get that. One, another mama story. Okay, right. So, so man, first of all, two a day, if two a day, you're in, you're in full pass every day. Every day. They, these guys got it made every day. From, you know, you start at six in the morning, you finish at four or five in the evening. You got, then you got uh, dinner, then you got meetings, then you get to bed by nine or 10 o'clock. That's, that's for two weeks. And I'll never forget, it was like a week, it was like 10 days in. I said, oh, hell no, I'm done with this. I said, I'm out of here. I won't get as a morning practice. It was a guy named Otis Grant. I said, Otis. I said, dog, I said, man, nice meeting you, man. I said, I'm out of here. He said, what you mean? I said, I'm quitting. I said, I ain't gonna, man, it's crazy, man. I said, we practicing. We don't get a chance to do nothing. I said, I'm out of here. He said, okay, man. I said, I was nice meeting you, brother. So I went through the practice, went back to my dorm, called my mom. I said, mama. I said, this is just too hard. I said, I just, I can't do this. She said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I want to come home. She said, Boy, you better get your ass back out there. You ain't quitting. <laughs> she said, you ain't quitting no football. She said, I don't like that sport. You're not going to quit it. Right. I'm like, mama, I told her, she said, I don't care what it is. You go back out there, you signed up for it, and you play. So sure enough, I won't forget when I went back to practice that evening. Otis said, man, I thought you was going to quit. I said, my mama wouldn't let me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Grown man. Grown and my man. mama wouldn't let me. My mama wouldn't let me. My mama wouldn't let me. All right, so you get, you get past that. And now you start getting into the groove of the season. And uh, I guess you had your doubts 
in training camp. But once you get to the season, was there a moment early on where it clicked for you? Uh, it's funny. I know you're a golfer now, and as you remember every good shot that happens, oh. do you do you remember the one moment or the 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 special thing that happened your rookie season that said, "This is it." Oh yeah, I do. Uh, my rookie season, matter of fact, and going back to that moment, like you say, even in practice, I won't forget. We in, in the NFL. I'm gonna say this: people who like guys sit around, man, I could have played football, man, man, I, I, I wouldn't hurt my knee. You know, oh, I, this happened. I didn't have a bad, bad, had a bad break. Let me tell you something, man. You can't play out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm telling you, you get your ass hurt. Excuse my little kid. You get, you get, you get hurt. I'm serious. That, that's that, the speed of that game. You cannot even fathom it sitting here because I couldn't. Right. My first practice, when I first practiced, when the veteran showed up, because John Robinson said, oh, "It's gonna be the same." Blah blah. blah. I'm like, ah, "It's gonna be the same." He said, "No, it's gonna be faster, guys." I'm like, "Ah, yeah, right." I won't forget it was Jackie Slater and a defensive end named Gary Jeter, and it was a pass protection. And when they said hike, it was like, <laughs> and I'm standing back there, I said, oh, hell no, I can't do that. I, said, I can't do that. And I won't, I'm, I'm trying to kind of not state the battle, I don't even want to see me. Right, right. So they say, hey, Eric, get in. I'm like, okay, so I get in, I, get, you know, I know my man is hit first. Everybody start moving, and, and, the, and the guy can't touch the quarterback. Eric, who's your man? I guess him. He said, <laughs> he said, get out, son. You get somebody hurt. <laughs> uh, I said, okay. So that was that. That's, that's, that's how fast that game. Then I won't forget, we played the New York Jets. I'm struggling a little bit in my first couple of weeks. You know, I had like 85 yards, 80 yards. Turned the ball over because, you know, they could hit you all the way to the ground. Wasn't no, your knee hit the ground to the whistle. So um, we, had the, we had a game in, in, in New York. The, we played the New York Jets. And we, we, um, we blew it over. And it was my buddy named Leroy Irving. I mean, he would argue about who's fat, you know, who's faster. He said, Eric, he said, you're too big to be that fast. He said, I said, Leroy, you can't run me, Leroy. So we'd argue about this. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm telling you, they got, a, they got a DB over there named Holmes. If you break, he can catch you. I said, he ain't gonna catch me. And we arguing about this on one to the game. So sure enough, second play of the game, what happens? I get tossed left, I break. Who gets it behind me? Holmes. He chased him, brother, he blew a gasket trying to catch <laughs> <laughs> So, So that was like my big, that was my big first big run in that game. But the, but the moment in that football game that I remember the most is the, the sun it was going down, the lights popped on, it was a, like, a, like a cloud, like a, like a film around the top of the stadium. We are breaking the huddle and Vince Ferragamo, he said, I'm going downfield, but I don't see anything, I'm coming to you. I said, okay, I was running, I was running a swing route. And I won't forget, I, I ran on my route, came out, and all I could see was, I saw that, you know, the rush was coming, and I saw Vince doing this. I saw his helmet going back and forth. You saw the horns just turn, turn. And all of a sudden, his arm came over the top, and I'm like, wow. I mean, it just hit me. Man, <laughs> this is the NFL. And I'm, I caught the pass, and I, <laughs> I, I, I picked up like 30 yards. Give me cold chills. I mean, that was just like my, right. that was like my aha moment. I mean, that was, that was a great moment for me. And I, that's, that's, that's the moment I remember more than even breaking the record in that moment there. So uh, you talked about your running style and it's iconic as you are, are, are pretty, pretty high as you're running and a lot of people tried to change you. And uh, I guess when you talk about those moments and when you break out and you showed your speed even when you were uh, 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 running really high, I guess that's the moment where you said, I don't know what they're trying to, why they're trying to change me. I got this, I know exactly what I'm doing. Well, you know, how, it's, it's like how you run and how you run. It's like if you're a basketball player. It's how you shoot is how you shoot. Right. How you swing at a bat, the ball is how you swing. You, you can try to change it, but when it, when it gets down to it, you're going to do it that way. That's just how we ran the football. I mean, I didn't run high all the time. I ran high when I got an open field, and that's what people got confused. I'm coming through the line. I would say, come up and try to hit me. You'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, my shoulders were, were, were low. And Tom Landry was, was one of the coaches. When they drafted him, I would get, we, had, we had a scrimmage with the Cowboys. And John Robinson told me after. After the scrimmage, he said, uh, Tom Landry told me, I think he made a mistake drafting him. He run too high, he ain't gonna last long. And uh, in that scrimmage, man, I was so nervous that I couldn't remember the plays. So I got in the huddle, and they called a play, and I'm like, who, who, what do I do? <laughs> You're getting the ball, and I'm like, where? I mean, I mean I was, that's how nervous I was. I, mean, I was nervous. And so that I, that I, I just left this time, I left the field, went to my coach. He said, I said, I can't remember no plays. I mean, he called a play, I'm like, what's that? I had no clue. <laughs> so finally he said, settle down. So I, I mean, I had to settle down. They called the plays, I remember them. I went back in and I, I, lit, I lit the Cowboys up on that day. 
And it was, just, it was just a scrimmage. And I'll never forget John Robinson said what he said. Tom came back to me and said, I think he's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we made the right choice. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So rookie season, you uh, get rookie of the year. The next year, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is when you broke the record yeah, for second yards. year. Yeah. yeah, 2,000 yards. 21.05. Oh, right, 21. Did you realize as the season was going on that that was a special season? Yeah, the, even the season before was my rookie season was special because I wanted to get that record then. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wanted to 2,000 yards because OJ was my favorite player. Um, matter of fact, I met him on a recruiting trip to USC. And I walked over to him, introduced myself, and I told him I'm from Sealy Tech. He said, yeah. He said, you running back? I said, yes, sir. He said, I told him, I said, I had 2,000 yards in high school. I said, I want to break your record one day. He said, well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was asking, he said, you know, I don't remember. I, I really don't remember because I was a kid. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted that record badly, you know, because I don't know why, but I just feel like that was a record to have, you know, as a runner, over right. 2,000 yards in a season. Uh, I came close a couple other times, but that season was a, was a, a season. I didn't think I was going to play. I heard I had a toe injury and, and in week, I think, four. And I didn't think I could even play because that's how bad it was. But they came up with a device I could put in my shoe. I played my whole career with it that helped me be able to run on my foot. And after that, man, I just started. It's 170, 180, 200, 205, 215, just every week was, you know. And the thing is, is when you're going for a record like that, you kind of try to stay on pace because you, you, and you got to stay healthy. Sure. You got to stay healthy. I mean, I didn't miss my first game until my seventh year in the league. That's the first time I missed a game. I and mean, we ran the ball a lot. But, you know, that record, I mean, it means a lot. I mean, I won't forget the day we played the Houston Oilers. Uh, and it was one of those days where, you know, back then, you know, they could really hit you, hit you and talk to you. You know, we talked to them. And me and a guy named David Bostic, defensive back number 25, um, he, would, he tackled me and he, he's trying to punch me. And I, t I told him, bitch, <laughs> I'm going to break this record on y'all today. Right. And we, right. We, we, we talk, I'm going to break this record on y'all today. You ain't getting I'm going to break it on y'all today. Watch. I mean, and then and I, mean, I just started piling up. <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, it just, like I say, it just worked out. <laughs> Did you think that that record would still be, will still stand today? You know, no, I didn't. I, you know, I thought, I thought that, I thought, you know what, I thought I'd break it again. Okay, I, right, I, right. I, I did, I thought I'd break sure. it again. I thought, I, I thought I'd get there again. Uh, but that record is, is hard to get to. The one that I thought would last the longest and it really has still lasted, people don't talk about it, is my rookie rushing record, the 1,800 yards as a, as a rookie. Because as a rookie, you don't get a chance to, carry the ball that much, be a right. centerpiece of an offense. And, you know, I was fortunate to, to do that, but that's the one I thought would last the longest. But, but both of them have stood the test of time. So while you were trying to get your worth in L.A., like you talked about at the beginning of this, uh, they called you a malcontent and just said a lot of bad things about you, and you wanted to get out of there because you wanted your worth. And then Ron Meyer, your old coach at SMU, is in Indianapolis. When you first heard the news that you were being traded, I'm pretty sure the happiness and the, okay, I'm finally getting my worth kind of flushed over you. And then the realization that you were in India and that organization kind of had you down in the dumps for a while. And I didn't really want, I didn't really want to leave LA. Okay. I wanted to stay. I really wanted to stay. If they could have worked out a deal, I mean, it just, it just wouldn't work. I mean, it just, I mean, they were, they were, and they, it was how, that's how I was in the league back then. I mean, they could, they had you, we don't have to pay you. I mean, that's just how, that's how it was. And when I got, when I run called me, I won't forget. I was going to a Christmas. I was going to uh, a Halloween party. I was dressed as a, as a, I had a, uh, probably couldn't say Indian. I had an Indian outfit, Indian chief head. I had, a, I had, because I like my stuff. I love Halloween. <laughs> right. I, had the, I had the war paint on. I was, I had, I had everything. I'm standing in my, in my, in my kitchen, and Jim, Jim Gray is standing there. We're about to leave, and the phone rang, and he said, "Man, come on." I said, "No, I'm gonna answer the phone because we're no cell, cell phones in the car, built in the car then." So I said, "No, he said, let me answer the phone, pick, pick the phone, Big E." I'm like. Coach, yeah. He said, "We just made a trade for you." I'm like, "I'm like, where you at? I didn't even know you were He said, "I'm in Indianapolis." I'm like, "Okay." He said, "You say you see that? Did I tell you I get you paid?" <laughs> and sure enough, he got me exactly the money I wanted. And um, man, I love Coach Meyer. I mean, he passed away a couple of years ago. I miss my, I miss my coach. I mean, I miss him. He was, he kept his word to my mother. I mean, that meant a lot to me. And um, you know, you know, like I say. Getting drafted by the Rams was the best thing, but you know, I, I, you know I, the time it ran out there. I know we're going to have some time for questions from the audience here, but I do want to ask the question that uh, 
when you have so much success on the field and then you realize that, okay, this thing is coming to an end, but this is pretty much all that you've known and that you're really, really good at. I just, I guess, want to get your mindset as far as your playing days, you started uh, getting less and less carries in Indianapolis, you got hurt, and then you go to the Raiders, and then you go to the Falcons, and even traded to the P Packers, Packers yeah. but uh, you didn't pass the physical. physical. So when you know that your career is coming to an end, did that have any effect on you? Were you kind of down in the dumps? or Because I always picture it hard for an athlete to know when it's time to stop doing this, especially the one at your level. Yeah, it's, it's, hard. it's hard, I mean, I'll even go back to, let's talk about Tom Brady. I'm going to talk about that situation. Okay. Let's look at him. I mean, we talked about, even on the air, we talked about it. People say, oh, he's done. I tell you, playing a sport like football, any sport that you love, and I say, I loved it. Loved everything about it when I first started. The sad thing is, at the end, they made me hate a sport that I love so much because of all the politics. And I look at Tom, I'm like, he's playing at such a high level. I say, he's he going to come back. Mm -hmm. He's back. Boom, he's back. For, for me, when, when it came time to retire, you know, it was, I knew it was coming, and I was getting tired of it, and I won't, I won't forget it. My mother said, Eric, she said, if you're still playing for me, Eric, get out of this game, stop playing for me. And I was still trying to play for my, you know, to, to sure. still help my, do stuff for my mother. Uh, but, you know, that my, I had an injury to my neck, but my time was, it was over even before that injury, because I just knew it. I could, I loved it. But I didn't love it. And, and, and we tell you, when you play on bad football teams like I did at the end, man, it's the worst. Right. It's like going to a job you hate. I mean, it's no different. You got a job, a boss you hate, it's like, I can't, man, I got to go see this clown. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how you feel. Right. I mean, it's like when you play in a football game, and I'm tell you, just like in, in business, you, you say, why are you doing that? That's what he makes it. We be on the field. Why are they calling this garbage? <laughs> Dude, this, this don't work. I mean, it's, and you're in the same thing. You're going to get players bickering and don't like each other and at the end it was just like oh i just i just couldn't stand it and i was i was glad to get out but then i didn't know what to do right i had nothing to do i mean and that that's the hard part because a couple of a lot of guys were still playing a few of the guys were still playing then when i retired and i picked up golf because guys like we playing golf today i don't play golf you gotta learn mm -hmm. and so i picked up golf but you know when you get out man i'm serious it, it's a shock i, I do the, i get the nfl credit they've done a better job of preparing the guys now than they did us. We had no, no preparation. I mean, you gotta think, when I came to the league, minimum wage was $40,000. Guys would play football during the football season and most of them have other jobs, like sell cars, insurance during the season. So, you know, it, it, was, a diff it was a different league. And, and, you know, being affiliated with businesses and a brand, we didn't know what that was. That, that, that didn't exist, you know, for us. So you had to, we struggled. A lot of us struggled. A lot of guys still struggle. I mean, I struggled at first, you know, just wasn't sure what to do has the money, but, you know, what do you do? You, right, you got to have right. something outside of football. You know, no, no life. It's just boring. So. All right, three quick things for me before we throw it to the audience. One, hardest you've been hit. Oh, man, a bunch of them. You kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Which one? I can tell you two in particular. I got hit in the NFC Championship game by Mike Singletary. And, uh, and I had been running over Mike for years. <laughs> but boy, let me tell you something, man. I won't forget it. I asked my boy Richard Dent, who's on that team. He said, Eric, he said, first of all, he said, 29 wasn't going to beat us. He said, that's what they said. You ain't going to be a win. Y'all ain't got no quarterbacks. So they put nine men on the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And we had a play called ISO, where the fullback was going to go into motion, go up and take on Mike Singletary. Dent said, what I did was I caved that side down, which Mike, Mike, Mike Singletary off, and gave Mike I mean, Mike Gooman off and gave Mike Singletary free run at you. And he did because I got the ball. I could just see open field. And I saw Mike coming. I'm thinking, he's going to get hit. Man, we hit like that. Pow! We hit, and all of a sudden, I got bent back, you know, all the black jerseys. And I won't forget, I got up, go to the sideline. I was fourth down, go to the sideline. She all right? I said, yep. I said, where you at? I said, Chicago. <laughs> What's your name? Eric Dickerson. Who we playing? I said, the Bears. What's your date of birth? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I said, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, yeah, all right, you just got to be in Yeah, just going, like, going back in there. Back yeah, in there. Yeah. And, and, and another time we played, Ronnie Lott got me really good. Me and Ronnie friends, and we, had, we got into an argument before, like after a play, and we got into a fight. And man, he, I got a picture in my house, a beautiful shot. I'm looking at, at all these players, for it, I'm in the air, but you can't see him, he coming, I see him coming. And I'm, I'm trying to get back on the ground. 
and he hit me in my rib cage, and I wore a flag jacket, and he, and he hit me, he said, guys, I said, you ain't kidding me, yeah, yeah. I said, no, you didn't. I walked back to the hall, and Vince called the run. I said, no, dog, he got me. <laughs> 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 so, you know, them was my two years. Okay. <laughs> Toughest place for you to play? Oh, man, uh, New England. New England? Yeah, I, mean, I hated playing the Patriots. They weren't that good. So it was tough to play up there for a couple of reasons. That it was cold as hell. The fans were nasty, and they said, and you know another team, the Jets. Oh, my God, dude. I can't tell a story here because kids in here, man. I'm serious, man. The fans, you, you'll be surprised. Right. I mean, me and a fan, we, we were arguing back and forth. And I'm arguing with him, and he, he arguing with me. I mean, but I can't tell, but it was, you know. Anyway. Okay, last thing for me. Uh, we, uh, we talked about the end of your career and how hard it was to give up. Uh, your signature as far as when you were playing, not only with the goggles, but it was the curl. Curl? <laughs> how, hard curl was it, gone. how hard was it to give up the curl, man? <laughs> hey, they got no hat. The curl gone. The curl been gone for years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, back in the day, you know, hey, hey, in the 80s, you, you had a curl. Come on. I had one I briefly. Had a curl. Briefly. Yeah. Briefly, S, yeah. S curl or, or real curl? Uh, uh, I had TCB. So you, so you see you had no money. See, <laughs> right. I had like, yeah, like a $20 curl. <laughs> <laughs> man. And that's why I was brief. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah the right. curl. Hey, man. They, you know, we said they had the curls for the girls back then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what? We're going to open it up for questions. That's it for me. I want everyone to have the opportunity to see if they want to ask the pro football Hall of Famer, college football Hall of Famer, all decade team, all that good stuff questions. So I know there's a mic here if you want to, uh, if you have any questions. Hey, Eric, huge fan, man. Hey, thank you, thank you. Um, well, one quick question. Mm -hmm. You know, you're such a super fast guy. Who, who really impressed you did you see on the field that you're like, whoa, that guy's fast, too? That was fast? Uh, a couple of guys. I won't forget, we played the Chargers, uh, and, uh, and he was on offense, man. I just, just talked to him, Anthony Miller. We, we, had a, we kicked off, and he, he caught the ball, and I'm just watching him, and he took, like, four steps. I, like, I said, whoa, that boy's fast. <laughs> I'm going to catch him. He, Anthony Miller was really fast. And Daryl Green, Daryl Green was the fastest guy in the NFL. I mean, he really was. You know, think people talked about Deion Sanders and Deion's fast, but matter of fact, I had an argument with a guy. This is about eight years ago. So we're talking on the golf course. He said, the fastest guy in the NFL, he said, was well, Deion Sanders, Bo Jackson. I said, nope, Daryl Green. I'm telling you. So I'm like, I'm telling you. So I said, look it up. So he goes on his phone. See, right here, Daryl Green, a 4-3. I said, how old was he? 50 years old? I said, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he's the fastest guy in the favor in a 4-1. So, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. A, oh, go ahead and get that one, then we'll do this in the back. Go, go ahead, ahead. Sandra. Oh, you uh, mentioned when you were at the end of your career and you didn't have anything to do. And then we see Ra here, he's sort of his uh, career as a football player, but he's also an artist. What, do you, what are suggestions do you have for younger players coming up now? Should they focus on the career, doing <laughs> both things? I, I, tell, I tell all guys, you know, especially young players who think they're going to the National Football League, I, I just tell them, I say, man, nine times out of ten, you're not going, you're not going to make it. I mean, and I, not, not to be negative, but it's just it's hard. Mm -hmm. But if you do make it, I said, have something else you can do after, really, because something you love, because I'm going to tell you, nothing has still taken the place of football for me. I've never loved anything like I love that. I mean, being on television, radio, it's fun and all that kind of, but playing football, it's, it, doesn't, it just nothing has taken that place. But I always tell the young guys to, man, get that education. If it's college, it's free, you know, and find something that you're good at. Don't, don't let somebody dictate what you do. If you love it, like, like Rod, great artist, man, man, gravitate toward that because my daughter's I, I tell you my daughter's a great I, I want to see looking at SMU but I would always say just do what you love because that that football that's a short life I mean I tell these guys say you're gonna be an old man a lot longer you're gonna be that win that number and that's just the truth yeah in your career <laughs> well I'll change the question that's my friend Ephraim Lynch we went to SMU together <laughs> <laughs> Looking back over the book, uh, the people who read the book, what is 
your idea of what would you like for everyone to walk away with once they read your book? Well, I, I think the main thing is, is first of all, my faith. My faith in God. I mean, and, and I'm and I'm not I'm not the kind of person that I'm not no preacher, not that preachy type. I like my my dad wasn't that type. He just, you know, he had his faith and 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 he that rubbed off on me. It really did. The, the, how my family raised me. I think the main thing is is and Lynch, you know me. One thing is I am loyal. I've always been loyal. My mother said something to me when I was a kid. She said she said one thing. You got one problem, son. She said that loyalty of yours. She said you're gonna find out people not as loyal as you. And I mean, that's, but you know what? I like that about myself. You know that, if, if we've been friends since college. I mean, if, if you're my guy, we friends, we friends to the end. It's no gray area with me, and, you know, and that's, that's how when I deal with the Rams, I'm like, I'm a loyal subject. I'm loyal. I mean, I play hurt. It don't make a difference. But their loyalty wasn't the same as mine, but my loyalty is my thing as big as loyalty and my God. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Okay, Bill. <laughs> Since we're talking loyalty right now. Back in the day when it was you and Lance McElhaney and Craig James doing it for SMU, it was just the greatest time for SMU, and we want you back. So how can you get reinvolved with the program here? That's <laughs> 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 really good. You know what? I just, had a, I just met with the coach, uh, Coach Lashley. Nice guy, really nice guy. And he just, he, he, he he asked me my opinion, and I told him that the thing is, is that we as a, our university or the football program, it's commitment. I told him, I said, you want to call me to help you recruit a kid? I said, feel free to call me. I said, if I don't know a kid in Alabama, but I know someone there, I'll help you. You want to try to get him? I'm the guy. I mean, for me, I love my university. I think people thought that, you know, I was critical of them. I was critical because we were losing. I mean, imagine, I live on the West Coast. I'm going to the USC games. I'm not going to go to USC. I mean, I'm, I'm going, they got me on the sideline of the USC game. I want to come to my own stadium and go to my games. I mean, and then, then you guys making fun of you. Man, y'all won one game last year. <laughs> <laughs> y'all won two the week before. I mean, the thing is, is that I want us to get back to where we were. I mean, I know it takes time, but I mean, I love my university. I want to see us be successful. I and mean, that's, that's all I, because when people saw that 30 for 30 that they did, people like, man, I didn't know y'all were that good, man. Y'all all of a sudden, it just like ramped up the school again. So most, I mean, I'm happy to be involved with the university. I, I, like I said, I love my school. We have one back here. Eric, how you doing? Hey, Samir. You know, I'm, I'm a fan, but uh, <laughs> I read your book when it came out, but if you can kind of tell a story about what made you Title it Watch My Smoke because it's not what I thought it would be like watching you run, but I think it's one of the most interesting stories you have there. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. I, I, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Matter of fact, um, there was a guy named Mr. Stanley LeBlanc, uh, and that's why I named it Watch My Smoke because of him. And basically, I could tell you he was like a, uh, a spiritual leader for me. I mean, but he was more like a dad. And I can say anything that, that, that I did. So I'd been college, I met him in college. And I didn't, and back I met him through my grandmother and him in college. He said, Eric, I'm not, a, I'm not a football guy, I don't watch football, but I heard you're a pretty good football player. I said, I said yes, sir. And uh, he just kind of watched my career, and I'll never forget. Um, he started telling me a few things. He said, Eric, I'm gonna tell you something. He says, um, you're gonna do things in the National Football League that's never been done before. You're gonna set records that won't be broke, maybe never. And um, everything I got to say that this man told me pretty much what happened. That made me, even when I got to the time I got drafted, he asked me, what team you want to go to? I said, I want to go to the Rams. I said, you sure? I said, I'm positive. Make a long story short, bam, I wound up at the Rams. And his thing was, boy, watch my smoke. <laughs> I told you. And so that was our kind of little, our little running joke, our running thing. And I said, Mr. LeBlanc, I said, if I ever do a book, and he told me, as a matter of fact, I take that back, he told me and that was 30 some years ago, he's passed away. He said, Eric, you're gonna do a book one day. He said, you're gonna do a book? He said, it's gone. and I won't be surprised, you're gonna do a movie. And I said, if I do, I'm gonna name it Watch My Smoke in honor of my friend Stanley LeBlanc. So that's why I named it Watch My Smoke. Hi, Liz. <laughs> um, okay, so obviously we were 82 grads and you 
literally made our time at SMU that much more <laughs> special. So I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. And um, so I don't think Mike Ford or Lance McElhaney are here today, but can you tell us what happened that day that um, we played Texas when Lance came in the first time? What was the difference between working under Mike Ford, working under Lance? How did things change? Because it seems like that's when everything just really went crazy. That's a good, that's a good question. Indeed, that's a really good question. Matter of fact, uh, Mike Ford was our quarterback. And, uh, you know, we just had the typical passing offense, you know, run, you know, running like dives and stuff. But we had put in a different offense for Lance, which was an option. And if they're doing that game, I think it was a close game. I think the score was like six to three or something like that at one point. And Ron Meyer made a decision at halftime, we're going to play Lance because they hadn't seen the option. And all of a sudden, when we started running the option, it was like they were confused. It confused University of Texas. And man, it was just, it just got good. I'm like, when we beat them, I never, we beat them that day because I hated Texas. <laughs> I hated Texas. Still hate Texas. I hate Texas. You know, you know, I hate, you gotta hate Texas. Hey, that's a strong word. I didn't understand them. So, it was so arrogant, you know. So, when we beat them that day, I, I'll never forget, and I just told it this morning. Um, we beat them 20 to six. They were ranked number two in the nation. I think we ranked like 20th or something like that. And that was a big thing. Matter of fact, and then the NCAA ships wound up at the school the next week. So anyway, when the, the, after the game, the alumni came in the, in the locker room. They were in wheelchairs on walkers. I've been waiting 20 years for this day. I mean, I won't forget, they, were, they were crying and, and I, I won't forget, I, I looked at my best friend and I told him, I said, man, I hope that don't happen to us one day. <laughs> and it's been like 20, 30 years. But yeah, that was, that, that's, how, that's how it turned around. There's that one move, we put Lance in and he never lost that job and that's why we, they changed it to Mustang Manny to Pony Express. So you've seen a lot of change moving back to the NFL. You've seen a lot of change over the past few decades. Um, I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on the next couple decades in the NFL, maybe where you see the game going? You know, NFL changes all the time, yearly. I think that, uh, you know, one thing is, is players are bigger. So you, you, I think you have more 300 pound guys, like on the defensive line, offensive line. You didn't have that when I played. The rules, some of the rules to protect the players, I do like it. Because let me tell you, like I said before, man, that is one physical sport. You cannot even imagine how the physicality of it. I mean, that's like me saying, you know, when I play, because I play, you know, guard of war or a shoot 'em up game, like, you know, on, on, on my TV, I know what it's like to go into war. It's totally different. I mean, no doubt. Same thing on the football field. I mean, it's, the, the, the game is changing all the time. They have to change the rules. But I think the one thing, the NFL is going in the right direction. I mean, I, I, I give them credit. They are going, and they try to help players as much as they can, even though they do a lot of things that's bad. But for the players themselves, they try to help them. Because let me tell you, after you finish playing football, you're beat up. I mean, you are. You're beat up mentally, you're beat up physically. And it's not all about the physical, sometimes it's mentally. I mean, because, you know, when you leave that sport, you give everything to it. I mean, I gave everything to that sport, you know, mentally, physically. Like, I can't sleep on my left shoulder. You know, I, I have. I don't sleep much, you know, you have football dreams, you have nightmares, I mean, but that's, the, that's, that's what you give up to play that sport. I mean, and, am I glad I played it? I'm glad I played it. I'm glad I played it for one reason, because I could take care of my mother, I mean, and give her a life that she'd never had, so. But like I said, for you, the NFL, it's going in the right direction. What about the devaluing of the running back position? Because we heard that a lot, and back when you played, running backs, that was it. That's what everyone wanted. And now it says you can get one in the fourth or fifth round and you'll be okay. You know what? If, if, if you, you can't get a real star running back in the fourth or fifth round, I mean, a real guy. I mean, because I think it, ha it started happening with the quarterback, emerging the quarterback. You know, if they want to throw the football more. I mean, back in the 80s, I mean, you had to have a running back because you ran the football. Now, you know, they throw the ball 50 times a game, 40 times a game. I still think that if, if, if it's a guy that's, that's that guy, like if I was coming out, if I was my younger self and coming out at 21 years old or 22, man, I would, they would be able, they'd have to pay me because I know me. I mean, if I, you gave me the right situation with the right line, you, it's all about numbers. You're putting up, if you're putting up 1,800 yards, you're putting up 2,000 yards, 
how you you got to get paid. <laughs> you got to get paid. I mean, that, that's how it works. But I know that the, the main thing is paying the quarterback right now. Yes, sir. How you doing? <laughs> What's up, my bro? Another guy I played with. Hey, listen, um, I know um, you've written a book, and I look forward to reading it. I haven't yet, but, so please forgive me. No I problem, Sam. I want to know, who are two or three of the running backs that you looked up to as a young man, and uh, who are two or three of your favorites in the game today? Well, my favorite when I was a kid was O.J., I liked Earl Campbell because, you know, being from Texas and Walter Payton, you know, and, and, I, and I, Jim was my friend, but I didn't ever see Jim play. You know, when you see guys play, like I saw OJ play. I saw, you know, Walter, I played against Walter. I mean, Wal Walter was a friend, played against Earl. I mean, we have a great picture of me and Walter in my house. It was my rookie season, I'm about to shake his hand and I won't forget, I, I said, Eric Dickerson, he said, I know who you are, you know, and that, that, that makes you feel good. But the guys I like to watch the play now is Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry, I mean, I mean, he's a, he, I think he's a great, a great player. I look at, um, I think I can't, can't think of the kid's name in New York. I feel bad for him. Saquon Barkley, cause, cause, yeah, Saquon Barkley, because she's getting beat up up there. You know, the, the running back you got right here in Dallas, you know. Ezekiel, I like Zeke, I like Zeke. I think Zeke has done a, a, a fantastic job, you know, here in Dallas, you know, running the football, you know, trying to stay healthy, but, you know, this game, like I said, you know it's sad. You play, you, you, you play. He, he played at SMU. You know, you know how physical that game is. That game takes a toll on your body. Yep. Any more? Any more? That's it. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the questions.